Well, good morning, and welcome to Fort Shoals Baptist Church. And if you're viewing us online, I'd like to uh, offer you a warm welcome, too. And if you are visiting us for the first time in the pews in front of you, uh, you will find a Connect card. And if you've been with us every week, the back of that card is a prayer request card. Jesus said, uh, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer. Uh, he said those words because God had told his prophet Isaiah uh, many years before that day that my house shall be called the house of prayer. So uh, if anybody asks you why you come to church, you just tell them, there's no better place to pray than in God's house. It is, it is indeed the house of prayer. This morning as, as we gather, uh, this is the last day to turn in joy boxes. Uh, joy boxes, uh, before this morning we had 68. As I came into the, uh, here this morning, I saw joy boxes walking across the parking lot. So I don't know how many we will end up with today, but today is the last day because this week uh, they will be going to a distribution center uh, and they will be headed towards Mexico. They will be headed towards uh, Kentucky. Uh, and some of the money within the joy boxes will make its way into the Ukraine. Uh, and their supplies will be bought and bags will be packed uh, for, for children in the U Ukraine. Uh, a, very, a very good ministry, uh, and uh, the outpouring from Port Shoals has been, has been absolutely great. Uh, without what you do, uh, the ministry would not be nearly as big. Also, this morning, we'd like to remember uh, Sandy Jenkins in prayer. Uh, she is in uh, St. Francis Downtown Hospital, uh, not doing as good this week. Uh, so uh, as we go to prayer, let's do remember Sandy. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day and this opportunity that we have to to come into your house, to lift you up and praise you for being the God that you are. Father, for all the blessings that you have given us this week, we just uh, lift you up and praise you. Uh, but most of all, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sins uh, so that we may have a uh, right relationship with you. And Father, during this time, we do want to uh, lift up Sandy Jenkins and all those that's in our Fort Shoals congregation that are sick uh, and, and that are recovering. Uh, we just ask that you heal their bodies. For we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. creation groaning is 
a new creation coming. Peace. It is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. Peace. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Does the Father truly love us? He does. does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. does our God intend to dwell again? everyone. Would you please stand and worship with us today?
Quatro negativos. Would you stand once again as we sing, praise him, praise him.
Would you please bow your heads with me? Lord, I thank you for the nail-pierced hands, for the cross, for the love that you give us that we do not deserve, Lord. And I just thank you that one day we're all going to be singing that song in heaven in front of you and just bowing down on our faces, Lord. And I just am so excited for that moment whenever it comes, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for everything that you are doing in this church, Lord, that you are doing in this community. And I pray that you... Allow us to see every opportunity and to take every opportunity that we can help this community, that we can show this community your love, your grace, and your forgiveness, Lord. We thank you so much, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for your, your worship this morning. Looking forward to that day when we can all worship in one voice. 
one nation, one tongue to our amazing Almighty God. We're going to continue our series this morning looking at the sovereignty of God. Uh, it's easy within the church to, to sing these songs. We, we lift our voices singing these songs to, to the God that we know is in control of all things, regardless of the things that's going on around us in our world. But in our culture, we want a God that's small. If we're honest, we want a God that's small. We want a God that's safe. We want a God that's domesticated, a practical, fix it all, uh, make you feel good God. That's the God that our culture desires. We want a God that, that thinks like we do, likes what we like, that we can manage, predict, even control. You see, that kind of God is acceptable. But this mentality proves that we do not understand the sovereignty of God. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom rules over all. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom rules over all. God's sovereignty concerns His absolute rule and control over all of His creation. That's what this verse plainly states to us. That He rules all things. His, his throne is settled and His throne is established. What that means is Washington cannot mess it up. Our nation cannot mess it up. Politics cannot mess it up. Popular opinion cannot mess it up. Because God rules over all. Which also means He is creator and placer of all things. Modern estimation, if you, if you look, if you, if you Google this, you will find out that our, our scientists today have discovered by way of long-range telescopes that there could be 120 billion other galaxies other than ours. But that's changed because they say they know better. And so as of March of 2022, they estimate that there could be 2 trillion galaxies. Trillion. Now our galaxy, which is called what? Milky Way has estimated that it has a hundred billion stars that none are even close enough for us to even touch. We see them shining, estimated approximately a hundred billion stars. That means that there are that many more in all the two trillion galaxies that are within our universe. And honestly, when we think of God this way, this is, this is where our mind just starts getting bigger and bigger and blowing up trying to understand. We... We have no problem with this concept that God is the God that created all of these things. We have no problem with this concept. It's not hard for us to, to believe that God orders the path of the stars. We can't say how He does it. We just know that He does, and if He didn't do it, the stars would cease to shine. That's not hard to believe. After all, somebody's got to, got to manage the two trillion galaxies that's in the solar system. God does, and we accept that. But here's the rub. Our problem starts when sovereignty becomes more personal. Right? Because we look around and there's chaos ensuing everywhere. I mean, to speak of the galaxy is one thing. We know we have nothing to do with it anyway. But to say that God is in charge of all that happens to me, the good and the bad, the happy and the sad, the positive and the negative, and that He is working out His plan that somehow includes all the details of my life and will give me what is best for my life each day, day by day, that's another story. 
We struggle with that. Why do we struggle with that? But God's sovereignty means that everything that happens comes about because He either directly causes it or He consciously allows it. Nothing enters into history or could ever exist outside of history that does not come under the complete control of God. And only when we grasp this, I know this is big, but only when we grasp this will we take seriously the issue of His authority. The hard truth is, people don't want to be under God's authority. Certainly those who are far from God, but unfortunately many Christians do not want to be under God's authority. Because in our society today, most want to be autonomous. Because our, our culture teaches that we should answer to no one. We prefer a, a God in the box. Who will, who will pop out whenever we need Him to, to bless us, to encourage us, to forgive us, to love, to provide direction. But until then, we say, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> but make no mistake, the sovereignty of God means that He exercises His prerogative to do whatever He pleases with His creation. I'm going to give you some rapid-fire verses here. Uh, just a few, and there's so many, there's so many on this topic of the sovereignty of God. But I just want to give you some of these verses. You can write them down. You can flip if you can go really fast, but you may not make it to the end. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Listen, when you start making universes, when you start creating planets and giving life, perhaps then you might have an input into how God does things. You might be able to say something to him, which is never, because you're not going to be able to do those things. So we don't have a voice in telling God what he can and can't do, cannot do, right? That's what Psalm 24 verse 1 tells us. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Psalm 135 verse 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. Isaiah 43, verse 13, God speaks to Isaiah, and he said, Also henceforth, I'm your guy. I'm he. This is who's talking. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Romans 11, verse 36, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. God's sovereignty means that he has the final say-so. Nothing, absolutely nothing, sits outside of His sovereignty. Your boss doesn't have the last say. Your spouse doesn't have the last say. Your parents don't have the last say. Now, I wouldn't encourage you to push that one. <laughs> but they don't have the last say. Your health does not have the last say. Even we do not have the last say. God created this world and everything in it. And He rules over all. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father God, this concept of your sovereignty is so hard to grasp because we look around us and we see a world that's in chaos. We see a world that is filled with anger, that is filled with hostility. God, there are all kind of emotions that are contrary to your will going on. Many of them we may, we may even have ourselves. And so, God, when we see everything going on around us and it looks like everything is falling apart, we struggle with this concept of sovereignty. But we have to understand, we have to realize, God, when the chaos is there, you're ruling the chaos. You're over all things. That's what you say. That's what you tell us with your sovereignty. And so, God, as broad as this subject is for us to, to try to address today, I pray, God, that we could understand, just catch a glimpse 
of your sovereign power and who you are. God, would you show up in this place today? Would you meet each and every one where they are collectively? Because you know where we are in our spiritual walk with you. And so, God, I ask that you would meet each and every person where they are and speak to them where they are. But, God, we don't want to leave here the way we are. I pray, God, that we leave here changed, ready to accept this, this part of your, uh, the attributes that you show us through your sovereignty. And we would live under this sovereignty. We would serve you under this sovereignty. God, you open our minds and our hearts to hear from you today. And I ask, God, that you would move me out of the way, that the words would not come from me, but, Father, they would come straight from you. And we'd be obedient to the Holy Spirit as you lead us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As I began to think over this attribute of God, I knew this was going to be a doozy. Because there are so, there's so many directions that we could have taken on this one attribute. There's so many scriptures that expound about God's sovereignty, and you can find it, fingerprint of God's sovereignty, all through scripture. And so our time does not allow us to, to look at the totality of God's sovereignty. I can't cover this in 30 minutes for you today. And you probably are say, well, you're already pushing that 30 minutes now, buddy. So. But I can't cover this in one sermon for you today. There's no way. And so I just want you to, as I ask you often, if you listen fast, I'll talk fast. There are scriptures we could have looked at. We could have looked at Romans 9, which is huge whenever it comes to God's sovereignty. We could look at Daniel 4 and the craziness of King Nebuchadnezzar when it comes to God's sovereignty. There are scriptures all throughout that we could have focused on. But I want to, give us, I want to really just give us a snapshot of what God's sovereignty is. And hopefully it will encourage you to take the step to discover it for yourself, what God's sovereignty really means. And so this morning, I want to give you two struggles that I believe is, is easy to see in our culture, but also two realities that we have to grasp concerning God's sovereignty. Two struggles and two realities. The first struggle is God's sovereignty allows us free will. God's sovereignty allows us free will. Ephesians 1, verse 11, Paul says, "...in Him we have obtained an inheritance." having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. One of the concepts of God's sovereignty that I believe many wrestle with is that if God decides all things, then why do my decisions even matter? I mean, if... if he has already determined everything that's going to happen according to His will, like Ephesians 1.11 says, everything happens in accordance to His will. Then why not just sit back, relax, have a cup of lemonade, and let Him do what He's going to do anyway? From a theological standpoint, what we have here is called an antinomy. I know you don't care what it's called, but I'm going to tell you what an antinomy is. That is, parallel truths that run side by side and never appear to cross. And this is a divide that, that divides denominations over this free will of, of, of our choosing and what takes place here. We're, that's why I'm not going there today, okay? I'll be glad to share with you any time how I feel about this, but we're looking at this overall. So here's the deal. On one hand, we have a sovereign God who works all things after the counsel of His will. Agree? That's true. On the other hand, I get to choose. And if I get to choose, then how much is He really in control? If God's really in control, then why do I need to make a choice? Do you see the ends you see the far ends of these. Let me illustrate it to you this way. Suppose I'm headed to downtown Greenville to go to an event at Bon Secours Wellness Arena. That's my determined purpose. That's my, that's my destination. That's where I'm going. But I'm not only limited to 385 to get there. 
It may be fastest, but depending on time of day and traffic, I could go a few different ways to get there. In the same way, God has determined in His sovereign will where He will wind up. But within the context of his will, he has many ways of getting there. And so he allows us free will to make choices. Please understand this. Our choices will not determine whether God gets to where he's going or not. Right? right? I know your heads are starting to get fuzzy. Stay with me. He is going to arrive at his destination. But our choice affects which route he takes. And so even if the choice that I make is not the one that God would have made for me, his sovereignty is fulfilled in my making the choice. When it's all said and done, the choice we make is going to be the one that he sovereignly uses in order to achieve his intended purposes. We're right back to where we started. I don't know if it makes any better sense to you now, but we're right back to where we started. That means that God will go with you, He will go around you, or He will go over you, but you will never interfere with His end result. Amen. Think of it kind of like a football game. That's something that's popular right now that's, that's, that everybody is, is pulled into. On a football field, there are sovereign lines. There's end zones, there's sidelines, there's hash marks, and there's, there's yardage markers all through. Those lines are sovereign, and guess what? No matter how you may care, they don't change. Those lines don't change on the football field. However, within the context of that field, two teams have war. They get to make choices in what they do within the confines of those lines, Right? And we know what happens. If an offense runs a good play, they're going to advance. They're going to move. However, if the defense, and that's their, that's their role to snuff it out, if they snuff it out, they're going backwards. But they haven't changed the lines. That's the way God works with us. He gives us the free will to make choices in this life that he has given us. But then it's going to be up to us. When we start pushing against his sovereign will and against who he is, he might say, uh 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 uh. Take two steps back. Here's your consequences for making that choice. That's his sovereign will. Amen. Or you can walk with him and follow him and love him and do those things he asks you to do, and he's going to say, keep going up the field, keep moving, keep doing this. Amen. That's the way God's sovereignty works. But here's the thing, that choice not only affects what takes place here on earth, not only affects our consequences and the destination and the path we take while we're here on earth, but according to scripture, it also affects our eternity. We have free will to make those choices, which is where it boils down to with our choice for eternity. The primary end that God is moving toward, that Revelation points to and all throughout Scripture tells us, is that everyone everywhere will give glory to Him. That's what we're moving towards. That's what we do in heaven. We worship, we, we give Him glory for who He is. That's the end result. But within that confines of being born and us going, going, to, going to be with the Lord, we have choices to make along the way. That's going to define where we spend eternity. Not only what happens here on, on earth, but where we spend eternity. Those choices are there. But Philippians 2.10 says this, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. You may have not thought about this before. But that means that some are going to be giving glory to God in heaven for all eternity as we live with Him in the splendor of His kingdom. That also means that those in hell are going to be doing the same exact thing. I told you, you may not have thought about this before. What is the end that God is moving toward? That we're all going to give glory to Him. That's the end result. 
Let me tell you something. Hell has no atheist. There are no atheists in hell. Nobody there doubts the existence of God. All men will for all time do exactly what God has ordained them to do. But in His sovereignty, He has given them a free will to choose which route they will take. And ultimately, which place they're going to occupy for all eternity. So, this is a conundrum that people wrestle with. God's sovereignty allows us free will. The second struggle is that God's sovereignty does not remove the presence of evil. God's sovereignty does not remove the presence of evil. I believe this is something that, that many wrestle with. Why does God allow evil to continue? Especially considering the way He feels about sin. On top of that, He has, he has the power to destroy Satan right now. So why is that buzzard still creating havoc? There's three reasons. Listen closely. The first one is God cannot sin himself, nor does he cause us to sin. James 1.13 tells us that. So we have to get it on the table first. God did not create evil. You need to stop people in their tracks when they say that God did not create evil. But what did we just come away from? He did create choice. And that choice opens the door for the possibility of evil. But mankind makes the evil actual. I know this is tough to swallow, but... God allows things, even if they are go against Him, because those things that are anti-God that we would, we would term creates the opportunity for Him to display all of His other amazing attributes that we may not otherwise have seen. How is that? Well, as we saw, we saw last week, choice to sin may open the door for what? God's wrath, Right? But it could never be fully seen. His wrath could never be fully seen without the reality of sin, without the presence of evil. And also the, the magnificence of His grace. We could, not, we could not measure the magnificence of His grace without putting it against the ugliness of sin or the presence of evil. So... God cannot sin, nor does He cause us to sin. He did not create evil. We have to understand that. Secondly, God is setting up for the final checkmate. Since day one that Satan tried to kick God off His throne, which I just can't wrap my mind around, how he sat over in a corner and tried to come up with this grand scheme, I just I can't, I can't process that. But God has been allowing every form of evil imaginable to rise up and appear like the devil has won. And if you look around our culture today, they will say the devil's in charge. He's won. Everything is chaos. That's what we see. But God is allowing every form of evil to rise up. And just when we say it can't get any worse, it does. Because he's allowing that evil to rise up. But then God is going to move the final pawn of his chessboard into play. See, it's all his. It's all his game anyway. And no one will ever again try to come up with a dumb plan to resist his authority. Let me show you in Revelation 21 what's going to happen. Verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. 
That's God's chessboard. Everything is here is here for a reason, and it is just moving in place. But this is the hope for the believer, folks. This is it. There is coming a new world with no more pain, no more tears, no more medicine, no more rehab facilities, no more, no more handicapped parking spaces. They're gone. Because all things are going to be made new. Paradise lost will be paradise regained. God will right every wrong and He's going to put away evil once and for all. But we've got to put up with it. And then the third reason why evil is still here is because God allows it because of His love. You say, what in the... You have lost it. You have absolutely lost it for you to say that love of God is, is allowing evil. Remember, God gave us free will to choose. Which means that the possibility of evil must exist. We are not puppets. He will not coerce obedience. Think about Adam and Eve. He places them in the, in the perfect place. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to do anything. It was there for them. He could have picked those trees for as long as he wanted to and had all the food at his disposal. God said, look at all these trees. Look at all this stuff that you've got. Your choice. See you later. They chose wrong. They made a choice. They chose wrong. They brought evil. They brought the sin came into the world. But if God took that choice away, if he, if he tried to coerce obedience from us, then God would invalidate his own nature. Because Romans 8.27 reminds us that God searches the heart which remains disobedient. And so for God to negate that possibility would mean to scrap the very thing that He created. We would have no meaning, no existence. That's why His love matters. In His love, He allows it so that we can make the choice to love Him back. But don't forget this. Wake up. Don't, don't go to sleep on me. God neither causes, insights, authorizes, or approves of sin. However, He does permit it by allowing us who are given a moral will to rebel against His authority. So go ahead and try it. Go ahead. Go ahead and try it. But remember that He sovereignly overrules any evil attempt to accomplish His sovereign predetermined purposes. Amen. By allowing evil, God also demonstrates another aspect of His nature. One of those attributes that we didn't really talk about but is clear his omnipotence. By allowing evil, he can show his power. So those are two struggles that I believe that people have. That we have free will and that evil still exists. If God is sovereign, why, why do we have either of those? We've covered that. Now I want to give you a couple of realities. The first reality is that God's sovereignty is ultimately to bring him glory. We said that that was the end result anyway. But his power, his sovereignty over all things is ultimately to bring him glory. In his book, Desiring God, uh, John Piper said this, The pleasure of human beings is not the center of God's universe. God's glory is. Do you know what that means? This might surprise you. It's not about you. It's not about you. God doesn't sit around all the time thinking about us. Wait a minute, Jay, but I, I, thought, I thought his love was shown toward us and that he always thinks about us. Yes. Scripture says that he never takes his eyes off of us. But that doesn't mean the same as saying that we are the most important things in the universe. God is the center of the universe because he is God. You see, our culture makes the mistake of placing us in the center as the most important. And so our good and our glory should be known from that. That's wrong. It's corrupt. It's, it's totally backwards. You see, with that mentality, we've already talked about this. God becomes some sort of, of supernatural butler, if you ring for Him at all, that just comes into our lives to save us and to help us find our best life right now. If we're the center of the world, if we're the center of all things, that's how we think. 
But there's an underlying theme in Scripture that points to God's glory, not man, as the foundation for God's sovereignty. I want to show you three of those verses really quick. I want to ask you this question. Why did God create the earth? It brought Him glory. Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Why did God choose to save us? It brought Him glory. Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 6, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will to the praise of His glorious grace. What does God want us to do with our lives right now? Bring Him glory. It's not, it's not trick questions. Y'all all getting the hang of this, right? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You get the picture? I could go, well, we could go on and on with this. It wouldn't change. God is by nature glorious. He gives us every breath we take. The one that planted two trillion galaxies gives us every breath we take. He is our reason for worship. He is our purpose for ministry. He is our meaning for life. By the way, He provided the way, the truth, and the life. God has glory by virtue of who He is, not by virtue of what we say. We're only glorified when we are made to feel glorious. That is, we, we have been ascribed glory. Somebody lift us, lifts us up. That's the only time we get glory. God exists for His own glory. You can fight it. You can pout about it. You can reject it. You can accuse it. Anything else you want to do about it, but whatever you do about it, it's not going to change it because God exists for God. So does everything He made. He made everything for Himself. Our lives are not about us, but about Him and His glory. God created the world and everything in it in order to display His attributes, His character, and His power. Now to the skeptic, and to maybe some sitting here today, this doesn't sit well. This doesn't sit well. That, because God is viewed as egotistic and self-centered. And we don't like it when people behave that way. So why is it okay for God to behave that way? Because He demands it, and He deserves it. Still too bold? I mentioned to you a while ago the end result of what's going to take place in heaven and in hell. is going to be glory given to God. But there are only two groups of people who will not voluntarily glorify God. Unbelievers and demons. Both will be thrown from His presence because throughout eternity, God is only going to fellowship with those who are voluntarily giving Him glory. So the issue isn't if we will or won't give Him glory. God will get glory because He is in the center of it. But because of all He has done for us, for everything that He has done for you, everything He has brought you through, and His sovereign rule over all things, doesn't He deserve it? Amen. It's a reality that we need to accept. God's sovereignty is ultimately to bring Him glory. But finally, God's sovereignty, once we get a grip on God's sovereignty, changes our perspective. When we really grasp this, it will change our perspective. There's a story told of a cowboy that had applied for health insurance. The agent was asking all the routine questions that went along with the, with the verbal examination of, of, what was, of what was going on. And they came to this question and said, have you ever had any accidents? The cowboy said, well, no, I've not had any accidents. I was bitten by a rattlesnake once. And a horse did kick me in the ribs. And that laid me up for a while, but I haven't had any accidents. The agent looked a little confused and said, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute, time out. A rattlesnake bit you and a horse kicked you. Those weren't accidents? The cowboy said, no, they did that on purpose. 
It's their nature. God's sovereignty says that things don't just happen. And once we accept that reality, we will have a proper perspective to view our whole life. As hard as it is to understand, the negative and the positive that happens in your life, folks, does not come by chance. As a matter of fact, we can wipe chance out of our vocabulary if we truly accept God's sovereignty. That job promotion that someone else got was part of God's sovereign plan. That traffic jam that you got stuck in was part of God's sovereign plan. We may not see it right then, and we may even go off because of the inconvenience or the heartache, but our mind would change quickly if we could see the horrific accident that we avoided or the much better job opportunity that came along later. Many of you in here today can testify to that. It doesn't feel good at that time, but that's God's sovereign plan. And one of the most profound and eloquent statements in Scripture, Joseph made it clear that he understood the sovereignty of God. Let me give you the the brief, even the Reader's Digest version of this. We don't have time to digest all of Joseph's life. Joseph was born into a very dysfunctional family. His father, Jacob, was known as a deceiver. He spent his entire life using people trying to get what he wanted. Joseph's story starts off in Genesis as a 17 roundish year old boy. He was striking, he was handsome, he was buff. And he was known as the favorite of Jacob. Now, he probably shouldn't have had favorites, but he was. Don't you think the 17-year-old told his brothers that? I'm daddy's favorite. I'm daddy's favorite. He let them know that, and they got irate with Joseph. They said, we'll take care of this. You won't be his favorite for long. And so they, they, they come up with a scheme to get rid of Joseph by faking his death throwing him into a pit and selling, him into, and selling him into slavery. It worked. Joseph was gone. He was out of the picture. But God. But God. Genesis 50, verse 20. You're, you're, you're familiar with this verse. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This is the confrontation between Joseph and his brothers after years of of separation, when he is now in control and in charge. Both sides of that statement that Joseph makes in that verse are true. You meant evil against me. What the brothers had done was indeed evil, and Joseph didn't sugarcoat this truth. What you did was wrong. You meant this to be harmful. They are 100% responsible for their sin. God meant it for good. In other words, God did this on purpose. Now, this doesn't mean that evil isn't evil. It just means that God is able to take the evil actions of sinful men and use them to accomplish His plans. What looked like a, a terrible, rotten day, and probably was, was actually God fulfilling His purpose through the life of Joseph. He couldn't see it then. And we don't see it when we're in the pain either. We don't see it because we have an enemy that keeps us blinded to the truth of God and His love for us. So we don't see it, just like Joseph. Listen, folks, our, our view is extremely limited. I've used this illustration many times. We've had it in our, in our men's Bible study. I, I've shared it in here with you. We see life through a straw. We look at our life through, a, through the end of a straw. We see it one day at a time and just a little portion of what takes place in our life. But God sees the panoramic view. He's looking from above all of these things. And so he sees, he sees everything. If we knew what God knew, it would scare us to death. But when we come to grips with the sovereignty of God, we will rest 
when we used to worry. We're going to give thanks when we used to be filled with bitterness or regret. In order to fully live out the victorious Christian life and experience the abundance life that Jesus died to provide, we must live and look at the events of our lives through the lens of God's sovereignty. And that's tough. What may come as a shock to you does not shock God. Sovereignty means that God never says, oops, I didn't see that one coming. He doesn't say that because he's in control of the big things as well as the small things. You know, Google can provide information and give you an answer to almost any question you ask and get you relatively close to your, your answer. But let me tell you one thing Google cannot do. Google cannot help you in discovering God's plan for your life. No shape or form. Because God's ways are beyond our ability to figure out. So don't try to figure God out. Don't try. You will cause yourself great pain and unnecessary anxiety because he is the unfigureoutable God. Folks, I know that the devil is at work right now trying to distract us from this divine attribute. He doesn't want you to think. He wants you to question God's sovereignty. I know he's at work trying to distract that because he too is on a leash. And he knows he can only do what God allows him to do. By the way, the devil's the only one that won't cross that line. If he draws a line in the sand, the devil says, uh -uh, I ain't going near that line. But we, on the other hand, will test that line. God lays a line out and we say, it's just a line. What's so wrong with a line? When you cross it, that's when you experience the consequences of God's sovereignty. But once we begin to believe this truth and accept this truth about God's attribute of sovereignty, we will start to see the purpose in our pain. God's end game for you is good. It's to spend eternity with Him in heaven. Trust the process. God knows the way. We come to this time of invitation. I don't know how God has spoken to you today. I don't know how the Holy Spirit is dealing with you today. Maybe, th maybe this issue of God's sovereignty is something that you've struggled with for a long time. And because of the events in your life that have taken place and caused much pain and heartache, you have a hard time trusting in a God that is over and outside of where we are physically. You struggle. So to just say, just bring it to God. Lay your struggle down for Him. Ask him to, to take, take the struggle away and reveal his power to you. What we don't see right now that's going wrong in our life, God means it for good. We have to accept that. So have you fully trusted God with your life? Have you fully trusted him with how you are living your life and what you're doing day by day? Are you really looking at the sovereignty of God as he is controlled and in, in control of the, over everything? Is that your mindset today? Maybe you need to rededicate your life to God today. Maybe you come today and realize that you've never accepted Christ. You've never asked Him to come in and forgive you of your, of your sins so that you don't know what it's like to, to live with that freedom. You're trying to control things yourself. But without that forgiveness, without that love, you don't have a chance in this world. And so I would encourage you today to not leave here if that's a question in your mind. Don't let the enemy distract you from what God is trying to do in your life. Let's stand. Let's sing. Yes, I